This podcast is sponsored by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Welcome to Permission to Speak, the video blog and podcast that loiters at the intersection of leaders who want their people to speak up, technology that facilitates connections, and results that serve our higher purpose. Now, here's your host, Kelly Vandiver. Hi, welcome to the podcast. This is Kelly Vandiver, and my special guest today is Nora Burns. Yay! (laughs) Let me tell you a little bit about Nora. She is a certified senior professional in human resources with over 20 years of organizational and employee development experience across a variety of industries and organizational cultures. She's a keynote speaker, trainer, and consultant on improving hiring and teamwork for better customer service results. Her companies are Insight Endeavors International and HR Undercover. The the HR Undercover work is the reason I asked her on the podcast. Realizing that she hadn't been in the shoes of a job candidate for a decade, (laughs) Nora decided to study and evaluate the hiring processes from the perspective of a candidate. She participated in over 100 interviews. My gosh, that's exhausting just to think about. And, And she shares her insights in keynote speeches, workshops, breakout sessions, and the consulting services is built around the mystery shop of your organization's hiring processes. Uh, but the research project didn't start stop there. Her professional mm-hmm. curiosity wander, wondered what would happen during the onboarding and training process for new hires. And da, 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 the undercover employee project was born. For one year, Nora went undercover in five different organizations, learning what was happening on the retail and hospitality front lines that others didn't realize was happening. Nora speaks on her experiences and offers mystery shop mystery shops of onboarding process and consults on how to enhance the employee and ultimately the customer experience. So you can see why I wanted her on the podcast. <laughs> welcome, and welcome, it was Nora. so hard to schedule time. <laughs> <laughs> She's a busy, busy woman. <laughs> well, Nora, as you know, we start out by asking you a couple of quirky questions and then get a little more serious and into the content. Excellent. So my first quirky question for you is, what is your favorite possession? My favorite possession isn't entirely a possession because she's a being. So it would be my exceptionally cute Labradoodle, Bella, who (laughs) anybody who's heard me speak has heard something about. And she's in the background here, so if she barks, my apologies. And so she's not really a possession so much um, as my my partner in life. (laughs) She keeps me sane. She helps me, you know, when I come home from a traveling to go deliver some training and she meets me at the door just as complete stress release relief for me so very she's cool. my joy very cool and how old is she how old is she she is 11 <gasps> but don't her. she does it now oh okay she's, we won't. she still thinks she's a puppy <laughs> <laughs> i have a six-year-old dog that thinks the same thing i wish he yeah. would i wish he would wear down a little bit but <laughs> he heard, she totally heard me and has just come in oh. to sit by my feet <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can uh, send me a picture of her, and I'll intersperse <laughs> that into the video version. There, of the, you, go. Uh, podcast. there you go. <laughs> great, great. Okay, so my second quirky question is: Tell us something surprising about yourself that most people don't know. Um, well, it's interesting because just this week I had a conversation with somebody who had a surprise reaction when I shared this, and that's that I did not leave this continent until I was nearly 30. The first time I went overseas, I was almost 30. And given my current travel schedule, because of the work that I love, that is surprising to most. But I went, it was my 30th birthday, for my 30th birthday and my mother's 75th. I'm the youngest of a large family. <laughs> um, we, I took her on a trip for two weeks to Paris and London. And that was the first time I had ever been out of the country and the first time she had ever been to Paris or London. So You had never even been out of the country. I had never. I had said I would have a stamp in my passport before I turned 30. And we went in October of the year that I turned 30 in November. Wow. Wow. Yeah, we snuck it in by that much. (laughs) So that was was the best use of credit cards ever. Like (laughs) My mother talked about that trip until the day she died. It was a great experience and I... 
I really encourage kids, kids being my age, to do a trip with one or the other parent, whichever that relationship is really strong with. It, I learned things about my mom I never would have known otherwise. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, how cool. I know. Yeah, it was amazing. I was just thinking to myself the other day, I should take each of my kids on a trip, just the two of oh, us yeah. somewhere. You know, I think that would be really cool. So One-on-one -on -one time with a parent and an adult child is phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. It changed the trajectory of our relationship without question. Very cool. Well, hey, we could end right there and people would have gotten yeah. some great advice. <laughs> there you go. Have a great time. <laughs> All right. And now for something a little more serious. Okay. Um, so when was the first time that you really got how important a manager is for making a difference in the lives of people? Oh, well, the first time I realized it was pretty early on in my career life. I was... 18, 18 or 19 years old, and I was working in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for a real estate investment company. And I was working as an administrative staff the summer after my freshman year in college. Yes, yeah, so I was 18 years old. And I came into work one day wearing a pants suit. Um, and at some point during the day, the senior administrative assistant called me aside and said, you can't wear that hair. And I was like, what? I can't wear, what? She was like, you can't wear pants here. And I was like, said the boss, just called her into the office, told her that she needed to scold me for it because what's the point of having a secretarial assistant if you can't see her legs? Wow. Yes. Wow. Day, I went on a job interview the next day. <laughs> so, wow. I was, I tapped out of that job really, really quickly. And just, so I spend a lot of the time that I spend with organizations on building cultures of respect and making sure everybody's appreciated. And that was, you know, at 18 years old, just, uh, wow, nobody should have to deal with this. Nobody should, this is not about my work product at all. And then subs, the, my next job that I left that company for, I worked with a man who ended up taking credit for a project that I worked on. And that was a good thing because it got me to go back to college the next year. So, <laughs> so without that, who knows what I'd be doing now. But yeah, so early on, I had some experiences with some bad managers that really got me thinking about how we manage our workforce and what a difference that person can make in that role. Now, please tell me you went on to have some good manager somewhere along the way. Oh, no, I totally <laughs> did. I, I had some really fantastic managers, and I am incredibly thankful for them. I had, you know, one boss I think of in particular um, when I worked as a regional HR manager was so supportive and so, like, I know that you've been hired to do this this job brilliantly, and I'm going to let you do that, right, And and did not – penalized for making decisions that ultimately might not have been my best, but we're still thinking outside the box and we're finding new solutions to problems. Definitely encouraged innovation and I will forever be thankful to him for that. Very cool. Okay. Very, very cool. So let us uh, talk some more about your, um, your HR undercover work. Mm -hmm. um, you focused on uh, the hiring process at first, but then you decided to take jobs and yeah. <laughs> experience that employment experience again. Yeah. Um, was it was it really just your curiosity, or did a client ask you to do it, or what were you thinking? What what happened? What then? was I thinking? <laughs> what was I thinking? Um, so the HR undercover it really started with the undercover candidate, as you said, which came out of my initial professional development. Essentially, I looked back at my own HR consulting practice and thought, how can I continue to raise the bar? How can I continue to get better and bring my clients a different perspective from what I'm currently offering them? And so I thought, I'd go on a handful of interviews. And I went on a handful of interviews down in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which is 90 minutes from where I live. So far enough away that I wouldn't recognize a lot of people, but close enough that I didn't have to do a lot of logistics with travel. And after that first set of interviews, I was quite frankly a little horrified by what I'd seen, by what I'd heard. And I was like, no, you, you don't ask that and don't do that. And nah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I thought, is this, 
unique to the employers that I was going to that were small to mid-sized companies and, and business practices, medical practices. And so that launched the full undercover candidate where I committed to going on over a hundred interviews coast to coast because I never wanted somebody to say, oh, well, that's how you do it in Colorado, but right. we're so much better here in New York or Alabama or California. So I committed to a hundred minimum. I've now been on over 200 because of uh, continuing research and some mystery shops that we've done for our clients. So when I started keynoting on the Undercover Candidate Project, I regularly had people come up afterwards and would say, well, did, we, did you ever take any of those jobs? And I was like, well, no, because I applied for all of the jobs as an undercover candidate under fake names. They were fake names, fake resumes, fake applications, full backgrounds. I, I, I created five characters. None of them were me. Mm-hmm. And I said, so no, because while I'm willing to do a lot for HR research, <laughs> identity theft is not one of them. <laughs> I'm friends with John Cilio, the identity theft expert. Oh, my gosh, no. <laughs> no that, was, that was a line I will not cross. So, And then I started to think, what if? What if, and I kept waking up first thing in the morning and thought, what if, what if I did? What if I applied under my real name? What would happen? And so I did a little bit of reverse SEO work because at that time, if you Googled Nora Burns, I was the first three pages. And I thought, well, I don't want that to happen. And there's a comedian and there's a folk musician. There's some big name people with this name. So I thought, well, we're going to kind of prop them up a little bit on their on the Google juice <laughs> and then I'll go out and I'll apply. And I applied for the first job, which was a frontline job in a Fortune 500 company, frontline restaurant type of setting. And I I told them some of the stuff about me. I had some developed <laughs> Uh, character types of information on that application, but I had a lot of real information about me. It was just a highly edited version of my resume. And when they asked, I said, yes, I actually also speak on HR. And I told them, I speak on HR and building a culture of respect. And I did not include the undercover candidate part of it, but I did tell them that I speak on HR. And that hiring manager did what many do. He had already decided I was his candidate. And he was so in love with me as a candidate that he made up some story in his head as to why somebody who is a speaker in HR and developing cultures of respect would also work for $8.20 an hour. And so he offered me the job. And I thought, why not? Let's see what happens. (laughs) And then I committed to doing, my goal was a minimum of three, but ideally five Fortune 500 companies over the course of 52 weeks, not all of them at one time, although there were overlaps, but that was my commitment that I was going to try to do that. And as you can imagine, it took over my life, like between managing my consulting and my speaking practice and doing these part-time jobs, that was about it. I was spent. I gave up a lot of stuff. Um, Sadly, not chocolate. So I ended up gaining weight during this process. (laughs) I was working these crazy hours and doing this crazy life. Um, but that's really what led to it was this professional curiosity and the what if, what would happen? Would anybody know? Would anybody care? And, you know, and then I just, it just, I'd just about be ready to quit one of the jobs and something interesting would happen. And I'd be like, well, now I need to see how to handle that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's how the undercover employee uh, came about. Now it all fun- falls under the HR undercover umbrella. Gotcha. Now, I, 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 Obviously, you don't want to reveal the names of the employers that you worked for. Exactly, um, exactly. I'm not, I'm not disclosing, which is very frustrating to some of my speaking clients who are like, "Well, you're not going to tell us." And I said, "No, because it's not, it's not about shame or blame. It's not about, oh, look what they're doing, and it, you know, it's oh, it's because of that company, and let's, you know, bad. My, no, it's about how if if there were trends across five different Fortune 500 companies." and there were, then this is probably something we all need to focus on and something we need to all get better at. So I don't want it to be about XYZ company, but about what can we do better? What what improvement can we make? Well, can you share uh, with us two or three of those trends that that were especially yeah. interesting or shocking or? 
Yeah. Um, one of them I categorize as bad math. Um, so there's, there's a lot of bad math that's happening on our front lines and I include it in a couple different ways. Um, one, one of the best examples is I go and work at a company and say, working part time, how many hours do you want? And I'd say, I really want, you know, 10 to 15 hours and companies who didn't want somebody for 10 to 15 hours. I said, I'm sorry, but that's, that's what I'm looking for. Now, they of course don't know. I'm also managing a speaking practice and a consulting practice and all of that, but that's why I wanted this amount of time. Right. Um, but yeah, so they at uh, 10 to 15 hours. So it's say, like, okay, great, that's perfect. 10 to 15 hours is perfect for us. And then on the schedule for the next several weeks, I would be scheduled anywhere from 36 hours to zero hours. And I'm like, it's bad math. It's, it, Maybe they're just it, averaging. It's bad. <laughs> 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 exactly. And so so there's a lot of, of that. There's a lot of um, and as it relates to the bad math and like scheduling as an example is when is when I'm scheduled, if I'm scheduled from noon until five, they may cut my hours at three because they ha don't have enough activity or they might when it gets to five, I need to stay an extra two hours, which is really hard for a frontline employee to manage because a lot of the people I was working with don't have their own vehicles. Uh, they're sharing a vehicle. They're taking the bus. They're ride sharing. They're doing all of these other things. And to make a big shift in the schedule like that shifts their lives a lot, yeah. a lot. And that was definitely a, a trend along the way. We tend to see what I, I liken it to Tetris pieces. Sometimes we tend to be thinking of our frontline staff as Tetris pieces that we're fitting into a schedule versus human beings who have this whole other extended life. And most of them had two or three other part-time jobs mm. trying to piece together an existence. Right. Um, so that was one of them. Another big one is, is on pay. We, I mean, like the main reason people are working these jobs is to get paid. Most of them, as it turns out, aren't doing HR research. So most of them <laughs> are actually doing this job to get paid. <laughs> and communication about when payday is, how you get paid, how a paycheck works for a lot of these frontliners who this is their first or second job and they don't know what, you know, FICA is. They're like, what's happening? What what's this percentage being taken out for? Communication about that. Colorado actually has a law that says you need to have a sign posted that says this is payday is on this day. It is, you know, at this location. This is how you get paid and when you get paid, essentially, wow. because this is a big problem. So Colorado passed a law because this was a big problem. And every employer I worked at, they had the sign. And in the large percentage of them, the sign was not filled in. So they had a blank sign. They had a sign that said payday is blank and you receive your payday paycheck from blank. And, you know, and it, so they had, so like corporate had sent them the sign and said, put up the sign, but nobody had filled in the lines. Wow. And that, that's a significant issue. Um, in one employer, I actually did not receive my paycheck until one week shy of 90 days. And I had a stack of paychecks. And it wasn't a manager that came to me to tell me that I had a stack of paychecks. It was a coworker who saw that I had a stack of paychecks. So the big three, the number three big thing that I would say was a trend, was a lack of protection of confidential information about our employees. Mm. We'll go through great lengths to protect our client list and to protect in the medical field our patient information under HIPAA, go through great lengths for that. And yet, my personal, in case of emergency number and phone number, name, address, and phone number, my case of emergency, was posted for all 300 employees at that location to see. Wow. Right? And my paycheck was put into an unlocked file cabinet that was accessible with my name, my social security number, my, you know, all of that information on it, accessible to any of the current employees or any of the past employees who knew where those were and had access. Oh, sure. So that was another big trend, was just a lack of protecting private confidential information of our employees. Wow. 
Yeah. I must be very shocking for folks when you explain this at your in your conferences and and yeah. such. Yeah. Yeah, it, there's a lot of shock and I had a lot of shock. I went out expecting different different results. Just kind of like I did with the in- interviews. I expected stronger interview questions, uh, better trained interviewers, if you will. And I had a similar experience as the undercover employee where I was like, come on, like you can do it. Like, <laughs> please give some encouragement to your team, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, and I had some that were standouts. There was one, um, one that really stands out to me was at the very first job, which I worked the longest. I had a shift supervisor who was consistently on it. When you left at the end of your shift, he would thank you for what you did, and he would thank you for a specific thing that you did. And every time, I just wanted to be like, yes, <laughs> awesome, thank you. And I'm like, well, that would be odd. <laughs> that would be really odd if this frontline employee said that to him. So, uh, but he was, and he was, he was a student, he was working on his degree, and he his goal in life is to be an entrepreneur. So it gave me great hope for future entrepreneurs because he wanted to run his own business and he understood the connection between that frontline staff and giving real meaningful feedback, not just, oh, thanks, that was great. But right. you know what I love about how you interact with our staff or how you interact with our customers or how you did this or how, you know, like, yeah. That's great. That was fantastic. <laughs> That's great. It's, I'm glad you had some good stories. On the upswing. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I, I'm sure a few people are uh, curious as to the kinds of jobs you took. So can you give just a broad brush to, to give a general yeah, idea? Yeah, no. So I focused on Fortune 500 companies and I didn't want it to be a small business where I would, my coming or going would have a major impact and major, major, major ripple effect kind of a thing. So I focused on Fortune 500. I also figured they had the resources to best treat their employees. So it would be, in theory, should be like the top-notch example of how to manage frontline staff. The other I focused on were jobs that I could fairly easily get, right? So And that were part-time favorable. So restaurant jobs, hospitality jobs, things where you had a lot of cus- retail, where you had a lot of customer interaction, where they were constantly recruiting, where there was an opportunity to, to get in without you know, having to jump through 17,000 hoops. Yeah. And, yeah. and that were really flexible for me because of the jobs that I work doing consulting and speaking weekend work was ideal because I needed, I needed jobs where they wanted a lot of weekend hours because that's where I had, it would have the least impact on my business. So, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. I always wondered how you did all that oh, no, <laughs> and still run crazy. your business. <laughs> And I've had, I mean, like one of the craziest examples is I had been in um, New Orleans, New Orleans, and I've been speaking at the Roosevelt Hotel, which is this absolutely beautiful property. You can almost hear the jazz music as you walk through the halls, right? It's just this amazing, fantastic property. So I flew in, stayed the night, did a keynote address in the morning, did a deep dive with their, their hiring managers in the afternoon. And then I flew back to Denver, and by 9 o'clock the next morning, I was wearing cheap polyester and making $9 an hour. <laughs> so it was this, this swing from one to the other where I go from I'm the expert in the room to I'm a frontline staff who very few people were, were quite frankly, paying attention to and wearing cheap polyester. Wow. So wow. it was a big – it was a – it was exhausting. And a little it schizophrenic exactly. too, it sounds but like. <laughs> oh, it's totally schizophrenic. Because nobody and this is one of the hardest things about it, as I as I'm writing and writing the books on this, the acknowledgement of saying nobody knew the full me for this period of time. Oh. Right? Because I couldn't be completely me with my friends because I wasn't disclosing the names of the company, so they didn't know. There's a handful, there's like three people who know where I worked because I needed some outlet and, but I, I couldn't be fully who I was and talk about work in detail because it would give away where I was working. And I couldn't be myself with the colleagues at these jobs because they didn't know that I'm actually an HR consultant and speaker. And when I said I needed off for one thing or another, I was actually 
flying to New York or flying to Chicago to, to deliver a keynote address. So it was a very tenuous spot to be in and feeling like nobody knew the real me for over 52 weeks. Wow. Wow. That, that, was that, that, was that had to be hard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I worked, uh, when I was in the military, I worked at a command where I was second in charge. And there were, so there's only one other officer that worked in that command. And so I didn't hear my first name for three years. Oh my and gosh. that drove me crazy. <laughs> you know, instead of my husband That's calling so me, interesting. instead of my husband calling me sweetie or something, if he said my name, if he said Kelly, I was like, Oh baby, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> cause I wanted to hear my name. <laughs> Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can relate a little bit to that, a little bit yeah. to that. Where so. were you that there was only the two of you? Well, uh, everybody else that worked for us. So um, they were all, uh, mm. there was like a 120. So everybody had to use full. full yeah, it was Lieutenant Van, yeah, I was Lieutenant Vandiver the whole time. I was never Kelly. Oh, wow. So, yeah. How interesting. Yeah. And the, the psychological effect that that has. It really right? did. It really did. I was like, please say my name, somebody. You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, no, it's a different world. It it's is. World. It is. Well, I'm glad you're sane now and in in one place. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm glad the fact that you think I'm sane now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so what impression did you have of those who, who managed you and what's your hypothesis about why the managers were uh, the way they were? Um, well, my, as a whole, I didn't experience great frontline management. I mean, it's just, I kept looking for it. That's why I was so elated when I found that manager who was like, wow, you handled that perfectly well. And, and this is a specific example of what you did great today. Um, or the flip side, like he gave constructive feedback that was specific and not like you have to try harder. Right. <laughs> you know? Like, I don't know what that means. Um, so I, I think the biggest trend was the fact that we had bad manager upon bad manager. And what happens is we're not investing here. We're not investing in these frontline managers and our frontline staff come in and they're managed poorly. And then we promote one of these people into the manager position and their only example has been poor management. And then that continues to go up until they get to a certain level where we're like, how come our district director doesn't know how to work with people? And then like, I can't imagine, right? It, so I think it's, I think that in the, in the organizations that I worked in, there was great pride in having been promoted from within, except then you had this, your, your example was not a great example. And so as a result, you're exemplifying that same trait because that's all you know. And so I definitely don't don't blame those managers for having a lack of skill when it just wasn't ever emulated. And I think it's difficult. And that's why I'm, I'm really thankful that in my career, although I shared two negative examples with you, that I had some really great managers who I then could be like, oh, this is what this feels like. This is what this acts like. And this is why I want to go work harder for you. Yeah. And I think that that's what's missing is really investment on that front line that frontline management staff. So do you think that's a, a, a matter of more training or what, what would help, what would have helped those managers? Do you think? I think it's twofold. I think it's more training and good training. There was one of the other trends that we haven't talked about with death by bad CBT. Um, <laughs> there's computer based training. That's really awesome. And that's not what I saw for the most part. Right. And, and reading a PDF on an electronic device does not a CBT make. <laughs> Although there were a couple companies that that CBT, you went and did your CBTs and you were reading tiny little font on a PDF on a screen for a certain period of time where they would justify and say, oh, they could have read it in that period of time. So really good training, interactive uh, facilitator led training. I also think that there is, I give great credence to organizations who promote from within. I sure. absolutely love that. And I think it cannot be your only path to management. I think you need to have a, a cross blend of people who have come from other organizations, who've come from the outside, who've come up through different training programs so that you've got a blend of ideas and that people can help each other out. And I think there needs to be a lack of, a lack of blame game when somebody asks the question. And, or says, 
I don't know how to handle this. That right. there are people that can come in and not only say this is how you handle it, but this is why I would suggest that you handle it this way. Right. So right. that's my that's my hypothesis or my working <laughs> hypothesis based on what I experienced. Very cool. Now, yeah. if 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 there's a manager that's listening right now and says, a uh, crud, <laughs> maybe maybe I'm not one of those good managers." <laughs> um, and you haven't had that example of a a good manager. What kind of what kind of things can they do? What kinds of things can they if their company doesn't support them or or yeah? One is I think you've got you've got an opportunity to meet some great managers and some great leaders through some of the organizations that exist in your community, right? Through the Rotary Club, through the Chamber, through the the American Marketing Association, if you're in marketing, through SHRM, if you're in, in HR, Society for Human Resource Management. Sorry, I shouldn't. One of my other trends is people don't explain their acronyms. <laughs> um, so let me not C explain my acronyms. CBT, uh, C CBT, Computer-Based Training. Okay, I got it off my chest. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. And I think there's opportunities through your local chambers, through your local Rotary Clubs, through even if you're volunteering with organizations like Habitat, look for the strong leaders. Like there are mentors outside of your direct company, out of your direct organization, right? So I think that's one, getting involved in volunteering organizations, the Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Boy Scouts, any of that kind of a thing. Get involved with community organizations. If you're a faith-based person, get involved with your church. Asterisk, do not talk about that church at the work. Um, <laughs> finding ways where you can seek out really great managers. And I am a huge, my mother um, just really put in my soul the fact that you should read. And then when you're done with that, you should read. And then after that, if you could read, um, that would be fantastic. So I think there's so many great books out there. There's so many great resources and your public library is free. Like go and get access to some of those, even if you can't buy the books, like get access to them. If you really love an author and you really want to read their managed book book, send them an email and say, I really can't afford this. I'm a frontline manager. Ask if they might gift you one. Some authors will, some authors won't. But if you don't ask, the answer is always no. <laughs> Beautiful. So, love it. Love it. That's love what it. I, I'll get off of this soapbox now. <laughs> great. That's great. No, that's great, great advice. Very, very good. Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of resources. I think too, all, too often we don't expand our thoughts beyond what is the company doing for us. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so for the manager or leader that's, uh, had listened to your stories and think, oh, things like that never happen here. Um, yeah. Any any advice you might have for them to explore that a little bit more and and yeah. try to get more of a, a reality check. We, we we do kind of get in a bubble as managers, and it's hard to to see us as others see us. Any any thoughts there? Yeah, I agree. I think um, I also agree. I did not expect. I did not expect what I found, quite frankly. I I expected a higher and more sophisticated level of frontline manager than than I encountered. And part of that is because I've turned a blind eye to it myself, right? Like because I've thought, oh well, we've we've been teaching, we've been growing, and, and all of that. So I myself was surprised. Um, it's unlikely that, especially like as the undercover candidate, I've now been on what two hundred interviews. And I have yet to have one that I'm absolutely like, whoa, nailed it, right? <laughs> like, I can't think of anything to change. I wouldn't have, now, granted, this is coming from a person who has an opinion on almost everything, <laughs> uh, three opinions on something. <laughs> so I get that I have a, a different eye. But it's unlikely that over that amount of examples across a variety of different industries, small companies, big companies, it's unlikely that if across that sample size, I didn't have one that I was like, whoa, I can hold this up as like the shining perfect example, that there's probably something we can do better. Yeah. So I challenge for, I'm, I'm a huge fan of continuous development. That's how this whole thing started, right? How can I get better? So taking a well-disciplined analytical look at what that hiring process looks like and then at what your, what your front staff is experiencing. You can do that in a couple different ways. Of course, I love getting in there myself with my team and doing a mystery shop, but most companies don't have the resources to do a big shop if they have a have if they're not a big big company. So, 
but you can do is do both stay interviews you can do post hire interviews and have hire a facilitator to do it who doesn't work for your company right so explain a stay interview a stay interview is asking people why they've stayed so we often do exit interviews and we're like hey why'd you leave and then in my experience sometimes we we kind of poo-poo those because oh well they left so we don't value their opinion as much which is unfortunate because we get some gold in exit interviews. I'm a big fan of exit interviews as long as we don't like talk ourselves down from accepting their insight. And then the second is the stay interview where I'm talking to people at 30 days, at 60 days, at 90 days, at 180 days. And I'm saying, are we doing what you were expecting we were doing in terms of your schedule, in terms of your management, in terms of how we communicate with you about our policies, our rules, our guidelines, all of that. And ask. Right. Just have those conversations about what's going on in the workplace. So I'm a big fan of those. And you can also, you know, talk to people who've gone through your application process who you haven't hired and said, would you still want to be our customer? Like, tell me what your experience has been. Mm. There's there's a great amount of data available. We just have to find the, a trustworthy person who can have those conversations with the folks. And that unfortunately normally means it needs to be somebody from outside your organization, not because there's nobody in your organization you can trust, but because the perception of confidentiality is stronger when it's an outside person, right, than it is as an inside person. So I read an article, I can't remember where I saw it uh, a few weeks ago, saying that when we do the confidentiality kind of survey, it's like we're sending a message that it's not okay to speak up and give your real opinion. Oh. Interesting. Yeah. Have you? That's, that's fascinating. I would love that article if you would send that okay, to me. Okay. I, I'll make I would a, be a huge fan. I'll of make that. a note and I'll put it in, in the show notes too um, for in case anybody else wants to. to yeah. No, I think that that's, that's an interesting point. I will, and I liken it to when people say, uh, to be honest with you, that oh, makes me crazy. <laughs> All I can think of, have you been lying Mine. to me this entire time? <laughs> so, yeah. So maybe it feels a little like that to some folks. For me, I like the idea of having multiple streams of insight. Nice. Right? So multiple streams of insight. So we want to declare ourselves as an open door. We know that some managers are better that, at that than other managers are. And so having multiple ways that employees can give feedback is strong. Yeah. I also think it's easier for introverts if they're having that one-on-one -on -one conversation or they're filling out the survey versus the extrovert who's totally most of the time okay with having that conversation um, along the way. Absolutely. So I like that. What I'm not a fan of and one of the things I talk with folks about, and I just did a talk at one of the HR conferences earlier this year, was on your employee survey and becoming an employer of choice. See that? See the air quotes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> employer of choice. We've gotten a little in love with this phrase employer of choice. And in my experience, I had multiple employee surveys take place at these jobs. I mean, I wasn't there that long, and yet I participated in employee surveys at at least three, maybe four of those five employers. Wow. Three. I think three. Three of them. And I know for, for having been there that short period of time. And the days that we did the, that I did the survey online, it was like, oh, take as much time as you need on your break. And oh, can we get you a soda? Or can we get you a coffee? Or here are some donuts and here's some pizza, right? And it was just a completely different environment on that day. And that, of course, has a bias. And sometimes it has a negative bias because people like me who can see right through it. And sometimes it has a positive bias. But it if you're not doing it the rest of the time, if you don't normally do celebrations, then that's not the one day of the year to do them. Yeah. Uh, it just sends a message that we're not really trustworthy. So I like giving lots of streams of feedback. And that's an interesting, I'd be interested in reading that article and that author's <laughs> position on that. I can, I can see, I can see a little bit, you know, like we don't want to say, Oh, this is the one time of year to do it. It's really important to, yeah. Same with your performance appraisals, right? Like I am a fan of having an annual performance appraisal, but I'm not a fan of having that done in a vacuum. That should not be the only feedback. There right. should be feedback. Here's the end of your first day. Let's talk. Here's the end of your first week. Here's the end of your second week. Here's, you know, and, and regular intermittent check-ins. 
But then, you know, I'm an HR person. We need some documentation, people. (laughs) So, (laughs) So, yeah. So I think the same is true there. It shouldn't be done in isolation. Very cool. Very good. Yeah. I, I, I tried to approach the authors of the study. Or I may be getting my, my survey. Yeah. My, maybe getting yeah. my articles mixed up. I, yeah. I, I tried to get one them yeah. to come to the podcast, but they didn't. Oh, didn't there you go. Come. I, I am fascinated to read that. Well, yeah. it's part of my HR geekiness. Let me read. Okay. Let me read. Let me read. <laughs> so um, one of the focuses of this podcast is to help leaders engage their staff, get them so they feel comfortable um, speaking up. What um, are, are some of the examples? You, you've given an example of saying multiple paths, but what are some of the things that you've seen that have worked well? Uh, and you know, why is it that you think those worked well? When we, in terms of getting managers to get feedback? Right. In terms of um, having them set a, a climate so that employees do feel comfortable speaking up. Yeah. Unfortunately, I saw a lot of the things not to do, which is hard um, because, I, again, I was really hoping for a little bit more bright, shining star opportunities. Yeah. Um, I can tell you some of the things that got in the way. Okay. Uh, one was they saw the behaviors that were being exemplified in other in other stores and other locations. Employees talk. They talk across your shifts. They talk across your businesses. So in, it, as one example, there was, a, there was a harassment in the workplace incident, a sexual harassment in the workplace incident. And there were some employees that were talking about it. And I interjected and said, who have you, who have you told? Like this is, it was an egregious act. And I said, who have you told? Who have you talked to? They said, well, we haven't talked to anyone. And I'm like, oh, there's an Amund's bed line. There's this, you know, you can call this person, you can call this person, you should talk to this person. And they're like, no, nothing will get done. So well, what do you mean nothing will get done? You Like you haven't given them a chance to solve this problem. Right. And like, shockingly did not get exposed as an HR person in this conversation because I totally sounded like <laughs> And said, um, you know, like you haven't given them a chance to solve the problem. How do you know it won't get solved? And they said, well, did you not hear what happened at such and such store like three months ago? And it, they described an even more egregious act. And I was like, they're like, that person not only still works here, but they've been promoted. And I was said, well, now, wait, you don't know. This is gossip. Like, we don't know the facts. Like, I don't. That's the story. But, you know, the game of telephone sure, stories sure. grow and grow and grow. And then it was like, oh, no, that was my roommate's girlfriend like it was a pretty close connection and I was like Duh. but still people in the moment feel a little bit more you know emotional about something they're like well here's three more examples of stuff that has happened and then nothing has happened so the moment we don't take action the moment we have uh, people being discriminated against for any reason based on the color of their skin, based on their ethnicity, based on national origin, based on their, their, their gender, their sexual orientation, based on any of those classifications, the moment it happens and it's egregious and we do nothing, we have closed the door to further information. Mm. The next time we're going to hear, it's likely going to be when the EEOC calls because they didn't feel comfortable approaching somebody in the company. So that was one of the big ones. One of the other ones where it was really just a shutdown was when they'd say we had, um, oh my gosh, we had an issue with theft in one of these places. And it was not internal theft. It was um, a ring of thieves across the greater Denver area who were hitting different stores and stealing particular products. And they had enough people come in that they distracted other clerks so that they could break a lock and and scoop electronic items and that kind of a thing, right? So high dollar value items. And a lot of retail stores have dealt with this in the in the course of their existence. And so they were bringing this to our attention and said, okay, we really have to be on the lookout for these people. We don't have a good picture. We have a picture, but it's not a really clear picture. And afterwards, I talked with the store manager and I said, well, you know, like I have a little, which again, I risked outing myself as not somebody who makes $9 an hour. I have a little nest camera at home, a little drop cam nest camera where I can spy on my dog. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. So I'm like, and you can set those up where there's, I said, why don't we just put one of those in the cage where this, where this product is that they steal. And that way, at least we will have a good image, right? Cause it's, 
it's it was like oh no we can't do that I was like cool why can't we do that? <laughs> and he said, oh, it would be a violation of our of our security contract. Like, they would never allow it. I was like, this is like the worst security contract ever. <laughs> like, we're not going to help you catch the thieves. <laughs> so I thought, wow, that was just interesting. And I listened to a couple of other employees surface ideas. And it was one by one. No, we can't do that. 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 There wasn't the exploratory, tell me more. What might that look like? How else could we do that? And where does that, you know, there was no exploration through those, through that. I also recognize that had I suggested my same suggestion as an HR consultant, it would have gotten more due process. It right. still might have been not the solution. It's still like, nope, not going to work. There's no electronic plug. There's no whatever. And it wouldn't, it's unlikely it would have been dismissed in such with such ease. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you're, if, if our listeners are listening, if our listeners are paying attention, you know, don't yeah. shut folks down, you know, right. Explore yeah. what, what's another version of that. Right. So maybe that's not the right solution, but what's another version? What's right. the, you know, do some, do some exploration, exploration of what that seedling is and thankful that our frontline employees care enough Yes. About organizations to offer up suggestion. Very good. Very good. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Okay. Um, uh, so I, I, I'm trying to decide if I'm asking the same question just a different way. Okay. <laughs> um, so what are some of the methods that you see organizations put into place to help um, encourage employees to give that permission to speak, uh, open door policies, social enterprise tools. Did, did they have any of those things at the places that you worked and did they make you aware of them? Um, yes, almost every, I gotta think of if I heard it at every, I think every single one, I have to check my notes. I believe that all five stated that they had an open door policy. Um, I'm not sure that there was a full understanding of what that meant and what that would look like and feel like. <laughs> so I just caught myself. I like sometimes look at the camera. Sometimes I look at you. Sometimes I look at me. So I probably, if anybody's watching my eyes, they're like, what is going on with this woman? Um, so they, there was not a full appreciation. It was not consistent from organization to organization. There definitely was one standout as I think about it that was really very adamant about like, this is who you talk to. Like these are avenues you can talk to. And they did have that, like here's a 1-800 number you can call. Here's the vice president of HR for the region that you can call. Here's, you know, here are a variety of different ways that you can report any issues. Um, which I think is fantastic because I'm a huge fan of having kind of multiple avenues. But I think, yeah, and I'm not sure. Again, I think it comes back to educating managers and staff on what we mean when we say open door, mm -hmm. right? And I flash back, and this is this is nothing new. And people listening who have been managing for a long time, this is nothing new. This is this is um, this is this is just not new. So years ago, I worked at a placement office. So I worked at a, a temporary staffing firm, and which was a whole other story, and I could do a whole other book about. <laughs> and, and our manager, though, there, we had a new manager, and she said she had an open door policy. And I was really young. I was still in college when I was doing this. And she said, well, she had an open door policy. So then we, we'd go in, and we'd ask her questions, and we'd, you know, whatever. And then she was like, I'm not getting any work done. Like, so <laughs> closing the door. <laughs> and then open door policy meant that between 3 and 3.30 on any given day, <laughs> we could go and talk to her about something. Oh, man. I thought, well, that's really great if it's, a, if it's an issue that has a long lifespan. But if it's this client is pushing back on this fee, and can we adjust it? Do I have authorization to adjust this fee? It can't work till three thirty. <laughs> kind of thing. So, I think it's kind of putting some parameters and giving some education and and a really a clear expectation on everybody's part as to what that means. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, along this journey, were there any uh, uh, pleasant surprises that you came across that yes. that you weren't expecting? Maybe. Yeah, I I really some of the folks I worked with on these front lines are just 
delightful and it was painful for me to not be able to say, oh, this is who I really am and let me help you, you know, kind of a thing. Um, so that's, it was, it was just joyous how much our frontline staff really wanted to make a difference. They really wanted to help. They really wanted to provide superior customer service. And sometimes they just got tangled up in what the expectations were across lines of, of, uh, in the organization, organizational charts kind of a thing. Um, I was really surprised by some of the organizations I work with their, the power that they gave to the front lines. Um, in one example, in a retail setting, as a frontline cashier, I had the authority to play with a certain amount of money every day in terms of if somebody came up and they said they had a complaint and there was, oh, this box is dented or the product is dented, but I really need it and it's the last one. Can you take any money off? At that one employer, I could. I didn't have to call somebody. I could say, yes, let me make your day. Yeah. Let me take off X amount. And we each had a set amount that we could do per shift that we worked and there was just a code for it, and there were no questions asked. You know, if we went wanted to go over that amount, then we had to ask permission. And most of the time, another employee would say, "You can have my X amount, right?" So, so there'd be, a, which is fantastic and very, very cool. empowering for frontline staff to be able to do that. And I love that. And I just the stories, the stories of the frontline staff, the reasons people were doing this job. People who were studying, who had just moved to this country, who had just moved to this state, who had decided that they needed to put a stake in the ground and stand out on their own, either from their families, from because of view situations or because of they left a spouse or significant other, and they just wanted to get their kid to college or, you know, just the stories of why people did what they did was just phenomenal. And I just so enjoyed meeting the people that I got to work with. Very it was, cool. was more beneficial than I thought it was going to be. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. What a fascinating life you live, Miss Nora. Well, before we wrap up, are there any other words of wisdom you'd like to share with the, the leaders and the managers out there that are listening? Well, I guess, you know, there's so many, I just, there were so many insights through this, but I think if there's one, it's, Take the time, leave some space to allow yourself to change and develop. Allow the space for your employees to succeed, right? Remember that there's a lot of gray in management. It needs, it's, it's just not a this or that binary world. And to take, allow some room to change and to realize that just because you've been doing it this way for 20 years, does not mean it's the right way to be doing it, and it's not the best or optimal way to be serving your employee population. Wonderfully yeah. said. Thank you so much, hey, Nora, hey. for being our guest today. It was so oh, well appreciated. You're welcome. It's been fast, fascinating, and fabulous. Thank you so much. Excellent. I could talk for days on this. <laughs> what I do. <laughs> so, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your well thought out questions. And let me know if you have any follow-up questions. All right. We'll, we'll definitely put all your contact information in the uh, show notes so folks can get Excellent. a hold of you for more info. Thanks Thank again, you Nora. so much. You bet. You have an awesome day. <laughs> Bye. This podcast was brought to you by Bigger Brains, online training that won't bore you to tears. Expand the minds of your workforce at getbiggerbrains.com. Thanks for tuning in to Permission to Speak. If you want to increase collaboration and innovation in your organization, check out more resources available at speakingpractically.com or give me a call, Kelly Vandiver, at 770-597-1108.